Grand Blue Fantasy Relink is a very specific type of co-op action RPG that I've always enjoyed playing. It has a hub and quest based structure that is pretty common in the monster hunting style genre, which has gained more and more popularity over recent years. But even before the hunting genre, there was a specific type of multiplayer dungeon crawling RPG where you'd fight packs of enemies while finding treasure and items in side paths before reaching a boss at the end of the quest. At first glance, this is the type of RPG that Relink seems to be, but based on what's been revealed so far, it looks like it has much more going for it. My previous videos have covered specific topics about Relink in depth, so they're still worth watching to see how we've reached this point. But the focus of this video will be my impressions of the gameplay, important pieces of information about the current state of the game, and my opinion on how all of the announced systems come together to form a complete package. There's a lot of information to untangle, but let's begin with Relink's structure. Grand Blue Fantasy Relink is an action RPG releasing on the PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5 and PC worldwide on February the 1st, 2024. Relink's gameplay seems to revolve around three main pillars. The single player main story, the quests that can be played solo or in co-op multiplayer with up to four players, and the various progression systems in the game. The story in Grand Blue Fantasy Relink is shown from the perspective of a character referred to as the Captain. They are the captain of the Grand Cypher airship, and in Relink, their journey takes them to an area within the Sky Realm known as the Zega Grande Skydom. The islands in this Skydom are guarded by primal beasts, powerful godlike creatures created by beings known as the Astrals that reside within the Astral Realm. The trailers seem to be hinting that a character called Lilith came from the Astral Realm, and along with an organization known as the Church of Avia, Lilith seems to be trying to utilize the power of the Primal Beast in order to restore a forbidden Primal. But I imagine that this is just the beginning of the events that unfold within the story, since it's been said that we'll unveil a web of intrigue reaching far beyond the borders of the Zega Grande Skydom and engage in a battle for the fate of the Sky Realm itself. The story mode in Relink is said to have a stage-like flow, but instead of being quest or mission based, the story is said to proceed from one event into the next, without the need for you to continuously return back to town in order to select a follow-up quest to continue with the story. So while playing through the main story for the first time, it will most likely flow in a way that feels familiar if you've played other action games. While proceeding through the story, we'll be able to replenish potions and upgrade our equipment at safe points. And even though the general rule is that we need to be in towns in order to change our party members and loadouts, we'll also be able to do it at certain times while out in the field during the story. The story stages that we'll play through range from larger open fields with secrets to find while exploring, to more condensed and scripted areas with a lot of set piece moments and environmental gimmicks to keep things exciting, like being able to use turrets to shoot down enemy ships. During the story, we'll be able to play as any of our currently unlocked characters. It won't be possible to switch our control character mid-battle, so we'll need to decide who we want to control before heading out. To start off with, we'll have access to six characters, and in an RPG side interview, it was revealed that as we progress through the story, we will receive items that can be used to unlock characters at a facility back at our base. So we'll be able to decide the order of the characters that we want to unlock just by playing through the story. There are no gacha systems in Relink. It's been said that it will take roughly 20 hours to reach the ending of the main story when playing normally without skipping any cutscenes. The Grand Blue Fantasy director Tetsuya Fukuhara acknowledged that the 20 hours may seem short for an RPG, but he wants to reassure people that the development of the story and the density of the gameplay experience will lead to people being happy with the end result. But everything related to the story doesn't completely end at the 20 hours mark, since it was said that even if someone is playing fast, there will be additional story content that will take the story related playtime up to 30 to 40 hours before you reach the true ending of the game. It was also mentioned that some of the dialogue in the main story will change depending on the character you're controlling, which is something that can increase the replayability for dedicated fans or specific characters. In addition to the previously mentioned story content, there will also be side quests that you can accept from the various citizens in the Zega Grande Skydom. Not much has been said about the types of objectives we'll need to fulfill for these quests, but they will help us learn more about this setting and the daily lives of the citizens. 
There are also character-focused stories known as Fate Episodes that will give us more of an insight into who each of the characters are. Some of these episodes will be more story-focused, but there will be episodes for each character that also involve gameplay and battles. So our total playtime will be dependent on how much of the content we decide to take part in while playing the game. There's still a lot about the story that we haven't actually been shown, but I'd imagine that after boarding the Grand Cypher airship, we'll be able to view some kind of stage or area select screen that will let us revisit previously completed areas or continue on to whatever the next available stage or area is. But instead of continuously returning to the ship or a town after completing an area, we'll most likely just continue forward with the story uninterrupted unless we decide we want to return to a town ourselves to take part in other activities like the quest mode. In addition to the main story, there will also be a quest mode in Grand Blue Fantasy Relink. It may seem like a standalone mode from the way it's been presented, but it's just an additional activity in the world that we can take part in that just completes the overall package. This is the part of Relink that may feel familiar to fans of other quest or mission-based games. Quests can be played solo and offline with computer-controlled party members, or they can be played online in parties of up to four players from around the world. You can be flexible with how you want to set up your parties, so if you want to, you can have two online players and two computer-controlled party members, or you can attempt to take on a quest completely solo with no party members at all. The choice is yours. While inside of a town, you can visit the quest counter in order to take on special assignments. To start off with, these assignments or quests continuously unlock as you progress through the main story. But once the story is complete, you will still be able to unlock quests as post-story content. Each quest is said to have their own objectives and side goals that reward experience and treasure upon completion. Some of these objectives will require that you take down a powerful boss. For other quests, you may need to continuously defeat enemies until the time limit is over. And there are also quests where you may need to explore an area and collect a specific amount of items. Or you can also take on some quests where you need to survive while defending a specific area. Some of these quests may even have additional hidden objectives that trigger if you successfully fulfill certain conditions, like spawning a bonus boss if you complete all the other objectives within a certain time frame. Quests in Grand Blue Fantasy Relink were designed with repeated play in mind, and we'll need to repeat quests in order to gather specific materials or hunt for certain equipment, so players that want to upgrade all of their characters will most likely be spending a long time playing quests. It's been said that there will be over 100 quests at release, and roughly 60% of those quests are considered post-story content. It was also said that the time it takes to complete each quest can range from roughly 5 to 15 minutes, depending on their difficulty and objectives. So we should expect to put in over 100 hours of total playtime if we want to complete all of the available quests at release. While playing online, we'll have access to various communication tools like stickers and emotes to quickly signal our intentions to the other party members. There are also quality of life features for online play to help reduce the impact of disconnections. It's been said that if you are playing online and one of your party members disconnects, the computer will take over control of their character instead, so the rest of the party shouldn't feel like they've been left at a disadvantage if something unpredictable occurs. To make the most of all the equipment and the materials that we'll gather while playing through quests, we'll have to make use of the various progression systems that are available. There's still a lot more to learn about the character upgrading systems in Relink, but after attending the media tour and speaking to the directors, I think I have a better understanding of what to expect from the game. Before leaving town to continue with the story or to head into quests, you can configure your party and each of its members in various ways. Along with being able to equip characters with weapons and accessories known as sigils, each character has access to their own talent tree, which they can spend points in in order to increase their stats or learn new skills. As we play through the story and quests, we'll obtain mastery points that can be used to unlock the mastery nodes on a character's talent tree. Mastery points will be shared amongst all party members, so if you obtain the points on one character, they can be used to unlock the mastery nodes on any character that you choose. A character can equip up to four active skills before they head out of town. Depending on the character, these skills can have a focus on more offensive actions like damage dealing attacks. 
Or they can be more defensive or support focused, like abilities that buff or heal party members. Characters can also be customized further by equipping them with specific weapons and sigils. Both weapons and sigils have their own traits attached to them, which can offer a variety of passive bonuses to a character. There are some traits that increase a character's attack, some that add supportive effects to a character, and others that have unique effects like being able to increase the amount of experience points you obtain from battle. There are also passive traits that are activated based on the current state of your character, or based on an action used during battle, like the stamina and enmity sigils that boost a character's attack based on how high or low their health is, or other sigils that strengthen your character if you manage to perfectly block or evade an enemy's attack. Based on what's been shown, weapons can be crafted and upgraded based on the materials gathered while playing in quests but they included a nice quality of life feature to streamline the process when upgrading. They've added the ability to check which quests you need to go into in order to find a specific material that you need. So you won't always need to use external sources to find information on the items you want to collect. According to an interview done by the Grand Blue Fantasy fan site Grand Cipher, Tetsuya Fugahara mentioned that players will also gain bonus stats just by increasing their weapon collection. So while we'll only be able to equip one weapon at a time, characters will still get stronger as we add more weapons to our collection. All of the previously mentioned character upgrades will go towards increasing a character's power level, which is a number that indicates how powerful a character is based on their current level and build. Each quest in the game has a recommended power level and their difficulty is balanced around it. It's been said that you can still take on quests even if you don't meet the recommended power level, but just expect the quest to be difficult to complete. So unless you're intentionally trying to challenge yourself, you'd be better off upgrading your equipment to reach the recommended level. Another form of customization that isn't tied to power are the color packs for characters. During my interview with the directors, Yasuyuki Kaji mentioned that they included different colors for each of the characters in the game, but you won't be forced into using a specific color even if someone is using the same character as you online. It's also possible to switch a character's weapon skins, so if you have a preferred visual style for a character's weapon, you can keep that look. So far there hasn't been any announcements about additional non-story related outfits being available in the game, but at least players will still have a way to customize themselves so they can look a bit different from other people using the same character while playing online. Each character also has an element that's been assigned to them, and it seems like every enemy has a weakness to a particular element. When questioning the directors, I asked about the elemental system, and I was told that even though the elements have some effect on the gameplay, no character element is essential to clearing any content. So if people have a favorite character, they can continue using that character in whatever content that they want, even if the elemental advantage differs. So with all these options, you can choose to build each character to play to their strengths, or to complement your own playstyle. And I was told that even when we manage to max out a character, there will still be a way to benefit from the extra experience points that we obtain. But now that I've gone over the outline of what the game is, now I'll tell you what it was actually like to play it. After watching developer gameplay over the years and seeing the various demos at events, I finally had a chance to try Relink for myself. The demo that I played was similar to the one that was available at past events, and I had the chance to play it at both the Cygames Media Tour and behind closed doors at Gamescom. The character selection was the same as the previous demo, but the area and the bosses were different. I had a chance to try every character that was available, and I put a decent amount of time into trying each one of them, just to see how they felt to play. So I've managed to put a couple of hours worth of total playtime into Relink so far. I played the demo on the PlayStation 5 and one of the things that stood out to me as soon as I started playing was how smooth and responsive the gameplay was, and performance wise I didn't run into any issues at all while playing. This demo put me into an 8 minute quest where my main objective was to defeat all of the enemies. The main target being Gerasen, a giant skeleton boss that was first shown in the trailer back when the Dragon Knights were first revealed for Relink back in 2019. 
The quest was pretty straightforward. Fight through two groups of skeletons and then defeat the boss at the end. But it's the optional sub-objectives in the quest that made things interesting. In addition to defeating Garrison within 5 minutes, I had to trigger a full burst at least once and also trigger link time at least once. Fulfilling these conditions activated an additional secret objective to defeat the rock golem boss within the remaining time. The battles themselves weren't too hard, but they were more challenging than expected based on the gameplay that's been shown so far. You can die very fast against the bosses if you stop paying attention to your surroundings, since their mechanics can catch you off guard and trap you in a damage loop or deal a lot of burst damage if you're not careful. But before this happens, there's usually really obvious telegraphing so you can move out of the way or block to mitigate the damage from the attack. So if I got caught by a powerful attack, it was usually my own fault. For example, Garrison has a frontal cone attack with a cast time that is clearly displayed in the animation. Evading this attack is pretty easy, but what can catch you off guard is the lingering zone that is left after the attack. If you pass through the area too quickly, your character is inflicted with gravity, slowing their movement speed to a crawl and leaving them vulnerable. Garrison also has an additional raid-wide casting attack, where shockwaves continuously flow outwards in all directions while it's casting. In this situation, at first I assumed that I would need to charge in and go all out with attacks to stop him from casting, or keep my distance in order to just wait until the attack is over. But while focusing on avoiding the ground shock waves, skeletons will spawn and leap towards any nearby characters in order to grab them and lock them in place. If a grab's character isn't freed by a party member, they will be teleported directly in front of Garrison, so they take the full blast of its attack once it's finished casting. When this happened to me, it managed to knock me out in a single hit if my remaining health was below 75%. Thankfully, the computer controlled party members seem to prioritize rescuing other characters that are downed or have low health, so I was back up and in the fight pretty quickly. The computer controlled party members were also pretty aggressive with their attacks and actually seemed to reliably perform combos and use their character specific abilities effectively. There were times where they couldn't avoid the boss's attacks in time and went down, but picking them back up was pretty easy and it didn't happen enough for it to become a concern. However, it was possible to use the terrain to my advantage and get to higher ground to completely avoid specific attacks. But since the areas that gave me an advantage were destructible when they were hit by the boss, this wasn't something I could do forever. The battle against the rock golem also had its moments that caught me off guard at times, like the slam attack that it would repeatedly use after becoming enraged and entering its overdrive state. The slam shook the ground, making anyone standing on the floor lose their balance if they didn't jump in time, which made me lose control of my character while they regained their balance. During this time, the rock golem was already preparing both a close range and a long range attack that would activate at the same time. Several rock spikes would form after each slam and surround the rock golem, and then the rock golem spun around and hit those rocks towards characters that were standing at a distance. But if anyone was within melee range of the rock golem at this time, they would need to evade the actual spin that was used to hit the rocks, since it was an attack that could easily catch someone off guard if they were still trying to recover from the ground slam. This repeated a few times in a loop, so it was possible to get caught in a cycle of being thrown off balance and then hit by rocks or a spinning attack if you got your timing wrong. Thankfully, there are recovery items and skills that characters can use to recover their health if they end up in a bad situation. A lot of these enemy mechanics seem to be designed in a way to impact everyone and not just the characters that fight at close range. Since a lot of the major attacks are raid-wide, it forces ranged attack characters to react just as much as anyone else, so everyone needs to pay attention to the battle. Over the years, we've been shown developer live streams and trailers with various bosses that have an interesting set of attacks and mechanics that we'll need to overcome. So the boss battles are definitely one of the things I'm looking forward to in Relink. I just hope that they'll be able to find a way to make the non-boss battle quests just as engaging and worth everyone's time. But it wasn't just the boss mechanics that were worth paying attention to in the quest that I did, it was the actual 8 minute countdown which surprisingly added an element of pressure to the whole quest when trying to fulfill all the objectives and defeat both bosses. Depending on the character, the completion time varied. Some characters got through both bosses with a lot of time to spare, but there were certain characters that left me with seconds to finish the quest. 
This is most likely down to experience, since there were some characters like Catalina which were really easy to grasp as soon as I started playing them. Finishing Catalina's combos or using link attacks increased her Ares gauge. Once the gauge was filled, I could use another combo finisher, link attack or skill to summon Ares. When Ares was on the field, I could use powerful combination attacks with her and I could also use her to enhance my skills or use a unique Skybound art. On the other hand, there were characters like Eo that could deal a huge amount of damage but required a good understanding of her cooldowns, skill rotations and charge times in order to use her effectively. Landing a fully charged basic attack spell or using an offensive skill seemed to charge Eo's mystic vortex level, which is indicated by the number of orbs circling her body. She can then begin casting her unique attack Stargaze, which can be charged up to 4 levels depending on the amount of mystic vortex orbs that have been generated. The casting animation locks Eo in place until it's finished, so it can be risky to use when surrounded by enemies. But based on the gameplay that was provided to me, you can evade mid-cast and continue casting when necessary. When casting Stargaze directly after obtaining a Mystic Vortex Orb, her casting speed is increased. So there's a bit of a rhythm to casting and releasing depending on how often you can collect and spend her Mystic Vortex Orbs. Eo seems like she'll be a powerful character to use and will be very strong when fighting against groups of smaller enemies. Even in this small demo, she was a little monster when it came to wiping out groups, but it will take a bit of practice to use her effectively. I believe all characters will have an equal chance to perform well in the right hands, but I definitely felt the learning curve was higher for certain characters compared to others, with Gran obviously being one of the easiest characters to play, considering he's a bit of a jack of all trades character that can fulfill a variety of roles. During the media tour panel, the directors did constantly mention how unique each character feels to play and how each of their battle styles are completely different. Based on the characters I've tried so far, this is very true. All of the characters really do feel completely different to play, which is impressive considering we'll have over 16 characters to choose from at release. Despite all characters having their own unique playstyle, they all share the same basic combat system. Each character can use a combination of normal attacks and unique attacks to perform combos. Depending on the character, these combos can lead to a variety of different effects when they're used on the ground or in mid-air. For certain characters like Siegfried, their basic attacks can be timed in order to increase the damage of their follow-up attacks. And for other characters like Charlotte or Lancelot, it can be used to perform a series of rapid strikes. The unique attack is different for each character and is usually used to activate a character's unique mechanics. For Gran and Jita, the unique attack will increase their arts level when used as a combo finisher. And when holding down the unique attack just as the combo ends, it can be used to rapidly charge an additional multi-hit attack. As Gran and Jita's arts level increases after using consecutive combos, the potency of their skills will be increased depending on how high their arts level reached. Each character can equip up to 4 skills while in town to be used while in combat. These skills have a variety of uses depending on the character and can even be used to alter a character's playstyle, like giving a melee focused character a ranged attack or a quick gap closer. They can also be used to deal a burst of damage, heal party members or impair enemies by inflicting status effects on them. Each character can also block with their weapon to reduce the damage they take or they can use a dodge to evade enemy attacks. If you use these actions with perfect timing, you can nullify the damage and gain additional beneficial effects, like a short invincibility buff after a perfect dodge. One of the focal points of the combat system are the actions that really encourage teamwork and a sense of unity between party members, the first of which are link attacks. As the party continues to deal damage to an enemy, their stun gauge, which is a blue bar that usually appears over an enemy's head or a specific body part, will begin to fill. Once the gauge is full, all party members will be able to perform a simultaneous link attack even if they're in the middle of another action. As you continue to perform link attacks and other party-based actions, the party's link level will begin to rise. When the link level reaches 100%, if all party members successfully use a link attack within a specific time frame, they will activate link time. While link time is active, time will slow down for the enemies and your party will receive additional buffs for the duration. 
like increased attack, critical hit rate, skill cooldown reduction and health regen. A link time bar will constantly deplete, so you'll need to pump out as much damage as you can within this time frame to take advantage of the opportunity. Another party focus action that can be performed are Skybound Arts Chains. Skybound Arts are a character's ultimate ability, and to activate them you need to fill the Skybound Art Gauge displayed under a character's health bar. This bar will gradually increase as you deal damage to enemies in combat, and once it's full, each party member can use their Skybound Art in succession to create a chain of powerful attacks. If the chain is successful, a supplementary attack known as a Chain Burst will be activated based on the amount of Skybound Arts that were used in the chain. The more Skybound Arts that are used in the chain, the stronger the Chain Burst at the end becomes. These group actions were pretty easy to activate and they genuinely did feel fun to use. Skybound Art Chains in particular will require that you get slightly closer to the enemy before you're allowed to join the chain, while the Chain Chance prompt is displayed. So even ranged focus characters will still have to get close to enemies to make the most of their Skybound Arts, which does create a nice balance since certain characters like Rakam can easily take advantage of their range to deal a lot of damage if left unchecked. But for people that may find everything that was shown a bit too overwhelming, Relink will have assist modes which will make the characters much more manageable to control for people that are not used to action games. These assist modes can be used in the story and quest mode, but you won't be able to use them in the highest difficulty content. It may seem strange that I've formed such a strong opinion based on playing a quest that lasts 8 minutes, but it was enough to give me a good idea of how everything will come together. All my opinions on Relink were formed after playing the original Granblue Fantasy and understanding what side games are capable of gameplay systems and storytelling wise. It's also based on what I've learnt about Relink after researching pretty much everything there is to know about the game and after talking to the development team directly. It's also because Granblue Fantasy Relink is shaping up to be the very specific type of RPG that I've been wanting to play for a very long time. There are other games that follow a similar quest format, but this particular style of co-op RPG has been lost over the years in console-focused games. Quest-based games on console definitely still exist, and it's the hunting genre that has popularized them. But Relink's specific style of quest-based dungeon crawling, which could be found in games like White Knight Chronicles and the older multiplayer Fantasy Star games, is something that's become harder to find. The closest you can get these days are presented in a more basic form in some free-to-play MMOs or mobile games. For example, the Fantasy Star series has shifted away from the more small party-focused dungeon-style gameplay into more larger open-ended quest spaces and more recently into open-world areas that have less of a specific focus. And there are a few other games that I've covered over the years that were pretty close to what Relink is attempting to be, like the Sword Art Online series. But even though I enjoyed playing those games, they always ended up missing the mark and constantly left me hoping that the next entry in the series will be the one that does things right. But if Relink can pull off everything it's set out to achieve, then it could definitely become the type of RPG I've been waiting to play. At first I was a bit concerned about the 20 to 30 hour story length, but if the pacing and the overall density of the story and battles are as good as what's been said, then hopefully I have nothing to worry about considering how much other content there is to do alongside the main story. So I'll have to put my trust in the directors and hope they can deliver on what they've said. But overall I can't wait to play Relink again. I want to be able to sit down and play a longer session that goes through the story, town and quest flow so I can see exactly how everything works together. But even if I don't have a chance to play Relink again anytime soon, hopefully this flow will be part of the next major reveal since a new developer demonstration is approaching. So if new information about the game does pop up, as always I'll be sure to let you know all about it. If you want to stay up to date with everything I'm doing in between videos, then keep an eye on the YouTube community tab or follow me on social media. I'll put the links to everywhere you can find me in the description and in the pinned comment below. I'll be making some new videos very soon, but until I make those videos, here's another that you might find interesting.